This evil servant is abusive towards others. He begins to beat. Tuto in Greek. He begins to hit. He begins to strike. He begins to punish. He begins to pummel the male and female servants. Ooh. It's profane to be intentionally hostile or offensive toward those who bear the sacred image of God. You want to know who are the people who bear the sacred image of God? Everybody. Because yeah. we were all created in the likeness and the image of God, which means that we have a sacred image that God has given us. And when we intentionally treat people wrong, hostile, or offend them on purpose, yes, 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 yes. we are beating them. Amen. And we'll have to give an account of that. If this word for putrid means rotten or to erode, if there's an erosion on the inner man, expect an explosion from the outer man. In other words, the reason why they act the way they act towards other people is because it's already going on inside of them. If I'm eroding on the inside, expect an explosion from the outside because there's something going on and wrong within me. So I begin to beat me, and if I'm hurting me, then I got to make you feel like I feel about me. This evil servant. The evil servant can actually be healed, but they refuse to through pride. The, the evil servant can actually be delivered, but they refuse to through pride. So if I'm, raw, if I'm rotten to the core, why do you think I'm not going to make you sick? Amen. For those who can't, let's stand on our feet. We turn to the book of Luke, the 12th chapter, verses 40, 45 through 48. And today will be my conclusion of our faithful and servant, a uh, faithful servant, our evil servant, part three, as we uh, finish up this portion of our uh, mishandling trip. Please. Luke chapter 12, verses 45 through 48 says, <clears throat> Excuse me. But if that servant says in his heart, My master is the land is coming, it begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on the day when he is not looking for him, at an, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with a few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Amen. You may be seen the Lord. So we're going to conclude uh, mishandling treasures, the faithful and evil servant, part three. For those of you who have been blessed with the privilege of going along this journey with us, we've been discussing the faithful and the wise servant. How the faithful and the wise servant will receive the rewards as they enter into heaven. But today we're going to talk about the evil servant. Uh, this wicked, this treacherous, uh, old school word is trifling. Servant. Let's, talk, let's start in verses 45 through 46. It says, but if that servant says in his heart, my master is the land is coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants and eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. As Jesus previously discussed the faithful and the wise stewards or servants, Jesus now highlights the evil servant. He highlights this evil servant in three particular ways. In the A clause of verse 45, he discusses this person being a prideful person. They have a prideful heart. The second way in the B clause of verse 45 is they are profane towards others. Profane means they are, uh, they are not holy or they do not treat that which is sacred as sacred. They are disrespectful towards sacred things. And the third way in the C clause of verse 45 is they are putrid or rotten with themselves. Now, y'all know how we get down. We break down every verse. So let's break down the A clause of verse 45, the prideful heart. He says, but if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. 
Now, if we're not careful, we'll skip this and not realize that we've heard this before. We've heard this before, and we've heard this from the enemy of our souls, which is Satan. Satan says in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 through 14, he has the five anti-wills, the five anti-grace proclamations. He says, I will ascend myself above the thrones of God. He says, I will be like the Most High. He was so prideful that he wanted to take God's place, but he said it in his heart first. Before it came out of his mouth, it was reverberating in his heart. Now notice that this evil servant is echoing Satan. He's saying in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. Mm -hmm. And when I get there, I want y'all to really follow me. But the issue is, he's, his heart is so dark against God that God is giving him grace, yet he's receiving it as delay. Mm -hmm. Pride isn't just the beginning of a fall, but the door of delusion. It's not just the beginning of a fall because Satan fell when, when God found pride in him. Yet he was so deluded that he thought he could take over God's position. Amen. Now, what happens when we become so deluded that we think that we are something that we are not? What happens when we are so deluded that we think that we deserve things that we actually don't deserve? See, truthfully, if you're going to be honest, little brother, if you're going to be honest with yourself, uh, the, the only thing that we truly deserve is death, damnation, and destruction. If you're honest with yourself, I know that you do most things right. But the few things you don't do right is worthy of death, damnation, and destruction. In other words, that high horse that you own, you need to get off. He says in his heart, my master is delaying. He's taking his time. He's, he's lingering. He's, he's waiting. He's tarrying. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't quite like that he's taking his time on me. I, I, I refuse to keep working for him and he ain't coming when I need him. My master is delaying his coming. Which teaches us something about impatience. Impatience can be a sign of pride. It can be. It, depending on how you deal with your impatience, it could be a sign that you are prideful. If you gotta get what you want Right now, you know, JG's went works. It's my money. <laughs> Not needed now. That's something called a process. And from the moment God gives you a promise, you have just entered into the process of receiving it. Impatience can be a sign of pride, while faith can be a sign of patience can be a sign of faith. Uh, just in case y'all think I'm shucking and jiving. If you're familiar with Psalm 27, verse 14, it says, wait on the Lord. Yeah, amen. I don't know if y'all know this. But yeah. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Mm -hmm. uh, he will strengthen you. Old folks say, wait, I say, wait, I on the Lord. I remember Mother Allie used to say that. Wait, I say, yeah. on the Lord. But just in case that's not good enough, Isaiah 40 and 31. Those who do what? Wait. Upon the Lord. Waiting is a sign of faith, which means if impatience is a sign of pride and waiting is a sign of faith, God will test you by allowing you to wait. He says, My master is delaying his coming. The issue is, God is delaying his coming because he knows he's prideful. Sometimes God does not come in your pride because if he comes in your pride, he's going to come with judgment. If he comes to your pride, he's going to come with wrath. So God is allowing that impatient, prideful joker to get it right. Don't you know God allows you to get the wrongs right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But that's what happens when you're prideful in your heart. But then the B clause of verse 45, we see that he's now profane towards others. The scripture says, Jesus says, and he begins to beat the male and the female servants. This evil servant is abusive towards others. He begins to beat. Tupto in Greek. He begins to hit. He begins to strike. He begins to punish. He begins to pummel the male and female servants. He begins to smite. He begins to wound. He begins to offend the male and female servants. While the core context is physical assault, it extends to various intentional punishments 
or offenses. In other words, you can be the person more than one way. Some of y'all was like, whew, you ain't talking about me. I don't put my hands on nobody. But you know, you, you got you to realize I spend hours studying. And God, throughout those times, giving me various ways to expose certain things that we do to other folk. So let's, type, let's talk about the types of ways we beat on people. Of course, we know we can beat on them physically. But did you know you can beat on people emotionally? You can be a manipulator. You can beat on people psychologically. You can play with their minds. Uh, you can beat folks with your mouth, with your tongue, as James says. You can be a verbal assaulter. You can beat people aggressively, which means your disposition and your demeanor is strong towards others. You can do it passive aggressively. Knowing that that person may need or desire your attention or affection, yet you're passive when you're around them. And you're consistently passive-aggressive with them. Uh, your disposition, how you carry yourself amongst them, act like you see this person, but you really see that person, so you make that person feel bad about themselves. You can do it with subliminal messages. You're saying something that is not direct, but that person knows you're saying it about them. You can beat them subliminally. Am I going too fast? You can beat a person neglecting them, neglectfully. Knowing they need something, yet refusing to give it to them. Consistently. Or you can be a character beater or a character assassinator. Anything to disdain or to slander this person's reputation, you can do that. And just ways that you can beat them. It becomes profane. It's profane to be intentionally hostile or offensive toward those who bear the sacred image of God. You want to know who are the people who bear the sacred image of God? Everybody. Because we were all created in the likeness and the image of God, which means that we have a sacred image that God has given us. And when we intentionally treat people wrong, hostile, or offend them on purpose, we are beating them. And we'll have to give an account for that beating. That's profane with others. But the sea clause says they're putrid with themselves. They're rotten in themselves. He says, and they eat, they to eat and to drink and be drunk. They eat too much. They drink too much. And they drunk too often. I'm going to say that again. They eat too much. They take in too much food. Drink too much. Take, consume too much liquids. Alcoholic, that is. And they're drunk too often. The evil servant is also abusive towards themselves. Not only are they abusive toward other folk, but we also see that they're abusive toward themselves. They become excessive with themselves. Therefore, they become excessive with others. Check this out. Check this out. If this word for putrid means rotten or to erode, if there is an erosion on the inner man, expect an explosion from the outer man. In other words, the reason why they act the way they act towards other people it's because it's already going on inside of them. If I'm eroding on the inside, expect an explosion from the outside because there's something going on and wrong within me. So I begin to beat me, and if I'm hurting me, then I gotta make you feel like I feel about me. This evil servant. The evil servant can actually be healed, but they refuse to through pride. The, the evil servant can actually be delivered, Amen. but they refuse to through pride. Right. So if I'm raw, if I'm rotten to the core, mm -hmm. why do you think I'm not going to make you sick? Mm -hmm. If I'm rotten on my inner man, why do you think I'm going to make you heal? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. One of the signs of putridness is the sin of excessiveness. One of the signs of rottenness 
is the sign of doing too much, the sin of excessiveness, the sin of doing too much, the sin of having more, the sin of not having enough, the sin of I gotta go get it, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, the sin of excessiveness. What is so wrong with the evil servant in their inner man that they feel like everything that they have to have is going to solve the inner problem? When it's really a lie. The more a person surrenders to a prideful heart, the more putrid and evil they'll expose themselves to be. You have to be careful when you say, I ain't going to do that. That wouldn't be me. You, 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 you got to be careful. You. You only this much of the grace of God from being exactly what you say you would never be and what you would never do. Amen. All God got to do is say, <laughs> from that grace. And you will become worse than what you think you are. Uh, worse than what you think you become. I know that because I've lived it. I've lived it. I, I'm a loyalist. I'm a loyal person. If I'm on your side, I'm on your side. I mean, it's time to die. And once I get in the car, my mind is made up. I was so caught up in sin and so caught up in pride that I ended up messing with my best friend's girlfriend. Never has that been a part of my character. But when you think you're something that you're not, God has to show me, host, you ain't what you think you are. I, I'm trying to tell you that you can't control pride when it's in your heart. It's only by the grace of God that you don't go as far as you could go. Now, in verse 46, we pass that. We pass that. Verse 46. He says, the master that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. The judgment of the evil servant will come when they least expect it. You got to pay attention to that. Dude. It's a judgment that they don't even know is coming, but it's already there. The issue isn't that the master came, but that the servants wasn't looking for him. That, that was the issue. The issue wasn't that the master came. Remember, we talked about how the master is there before you get a chance to be aware that he's there. Uh, before he knocks on the door, he's looking. If you read verse 36, you read verse 38, you read verse 43, we see that the master is there. And for the good servant, for the faithful servant, for the wise servant, he comes there with a reward. But for this wicked one, he comes with punishment. He comes with judgment. He comes with wrath. Look at this. When you're not watching for him, Jesus that is, you won't be working while you're waiting for him. All of us got a work to do. Every last one of us in the household of faith today has something we can do for Christ and we'll be blessed for it. God wants us to regularly have our hands on the gospel plow of doing something for him. That don't mean you don't get your eight hours of sleep. Sleep! <laughs> sleep while you can. But when you get up, know that everything you do represents Christ. Yes. When you get up, know that when you say something, Jesus said. When you do something, Jesus did. When you, not, when you don't think nobody's watching, they watch it. But Jesus is watching Always be working for him. So while you're watching for him, you're also waiting for him. This is very important to me, y'all. Uh, this is very important to me because I know that we think coming to church is a good work. And while it's beneficial, it ain't a good work. And while it's helpful, it ain't a good work. You, you come in here to get filled up so you can go to work. Because some, some of us just use this as a checkoff and think you've done your good deed for the week. Do you realize that most of the time when you come to church, you don't do nothing? Oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to put it this way. I'm going to put it this way. You don't pray. You don't praise. You don't serve. You just sit and eat. That's all you do. Just come and get fed. And you think that's supposed to be a reward? No. Uh, they ain't going to let me preach no more. Listen to this. Uh, I, I, I said this last week. I'm just reiterating. Oftentimes, I'll go and I'll visit my kids at school. I'll just pop up. They won't even know I'm showing up. I ain't even doing my nieces and nephews. I just pop up and I'll 
peek into the classes. They won't see me. And I watch them. I watch Rayaya, I watch Serenity, I watch Brandon, Isaac, Jeremiah, I watch Kayla and Caleb. I'll just watch them. And I just watch how they have fun in class. I just watch how they're not paying attention in class. I just watch how they're doing their work in class. I just watch. You gotta be careful, Nisi, because I've seen you. I'll be watching. <laughs> and then I will ask certain questions when they get home or when I see them. With them not realizing that I saw certain things before I'm asking them certain questions. I'm going somewhere. Is it possible that certain things that's happening in our lives because God is saying, I'm watching you? I see you don't want to let go of something, so I'm going to give you something to help, something that's going to help you to let it go to see if you're going to let it go? I see you got an issue in your life that you don't want to entrust to me, so I'm going to continue to keep this issue in your life so you can give it to me. So I, I'm watching. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Be careful. Because when he comes with these moments, it's, it's asking for blessings or wrath. Knows what it says. The scripture says this, verse 46. It says, and, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. This speaks to the utter destruction of the evil servant. The, the, this, this servant will be utterly destroyed. Scripture says, Jesus says, cut in two. Now, cut him in two isn't literal, but a hyperbolous, exaggerated way to describe the severity of the final judgment. In other words, it's going to be harsh. It's going to be devastating. It's going to be half open, ripped up. It's not going to be repairable. You can't come back from it. It's going to be the most devastating punishment that the evil servant could experience. But I want, I want to compare this statement to actual hell. To cut him in two will actually be lighter than what's going to actually happen. The best thing that could happen if we were actually cut in two. As, you ever got, how many of you got cut? It's painful. You cut your hand or got cut or uh, got cut on your back with a whooping. You know. <laughs> Don't feel too well, right? Well. What well, can you imagine as most theologians believe the prophet Isaiah was sawn in two, sawn in sawn or something? He was cut in half. That was, ooh, can you imagine that pain? Can you imagine that? Some of us don't even like to be pinched. I mean, to be cut in two? Yet that's light work compared to hell. To be cut in two and have your soul released from his body. That's the easy thing. But hell's fire, where the evil servant will ultimately spend eternity, is way more devastating than just being cut in two. So if you are eroding yourself by drinking yourself to death and smoking yourself to death and pill popping yourself to death and needling yourself to death and, and beating other people and mistreating other people, the best thing that can happen to you is you get cut in two. Mm. The evil servant. The evil servant is swiftly and quickly judged. Notice not only the severity of, of the judgment, but the swiftness of the judgment. The, he's ignorant. He's not looking for him. He's not aware of him. And then all of a sudden, he's cut in two. It happens in a moment where he doesn't realize. As Jesus says, the moment, the twinkling of an eye is quick. And then the evil servant will be in the segment of the unbelievers. This bothered me because the issue is this. The servant had a relationship with the master. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. This evil servant first has a relationship with the master before he's given his portion with the unbelievers. Right. Pay attention. He's called a servant, yet we see him as an evil one. And now because of his evil ways, he now has his place or segment with the unbelievers in judgment. Now this isn't about work-based faith, but faith-based works. Amen. Verse 45 says, he says in his heart. In other words, he, you can't just do this so I can be saved. I ain't doing all these good works because, because I want to be saved. Amen. I'm doing these because I am saved. Work-based faith is when you work yourself 
to salvation, which means you're working for nothing. Faith-based works is when you allow the Holy Spirit to work in you and work out of you. Therefore, it is an outworking of faith. Amen. So if I'm picking up all these chairs in the sanctuary to show God I'm, I want to be saved, I'm working for nothing. Amen. Back hurt. Knees buckling. Over here putting on the front like I'm strong when I'm really about to cry. But when I allow the working of the Holy Spirit to say, pick up those chairs. Yes, Lord. It's because I'm responding to an inward call, which is God's Holy Spirit working on the inside of me. Therefore, he's doing the work outside of me. Verses 47, 48, I'm about to sit down. It says, and that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. There are levels to judgment. The same way God's going to give levels of reward to the faithful and to the wise, there are going to be levels of judgment. Not everyone will receive the same punishment. Jesus gives details of judgment per revelation knowledge. In verse 47, he discusses a stricter judgment because strong revelation and knowledge. That is an extension of our sin. In other words, we know what we're supposed to do, yet we don't do it anyway. We know we're supposed to do it and we choose not to do it. That's why James 4 and 17 says to him who knows to do right and don't do it, to him it is sin. That's an extension of our sin. This primarily pertains to preachers and teachers. This is mainly to those who minister the gospel. This is really to us. It's not exclusively to us, but it's primarily to us. Because some of y'all know what to do too. But it's, but it's primarily speaking to us as preachers and teachers because James chapter 3 verse 1 says, Let not many of you desire to become teachers, for we have a stricter judgment. In other words, our punishment will be more severe if we know the truth of the gospel, yet we live contrary to it. Since am I doing all right? I'm doing my best to teach this thing clearly. Verse 48 deals with a less strict judgment due to the lack of revelation knowledge. This is an extenuation of our sin. In other words, a partial excuse. Not a full excuse, but a partial excuse. Because not everybody receives the same things the same way. And God knows that. So don't be the one talking about, I didn't know when you actually did, thinking God's going to hold you accountable to the grace that somebody else going to get. Right, 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 right. Don't set yourself up for failure. Verse 47. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. This unfaithful and foolish servant isn't ignorant, but ignores. Ignorant means I don't know. Ignores means I see it and I choose to do it anyway. See, when I was younger, I used to act like I didn't hear my mom. I used to act like. I did. I used to, I'm grown. I can do it now. I used to act like I didn't hear my mom. I was ignoring her. And then judgment that came, James called Roy. And I should have listened the first time. In other words, just because you play dumb don't mean you are. This unfaithful and foolish servant knows what he's supposed to do, and he's not ignorant, so he is ignoring the master's call. Says he knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will. Brothers and sisters, this is rebellion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is rebellion. Yeah. How can we stand before a holy God in a clear word and say, I ain't going to do it? Yeah. That's rebellion. Yeah. I know what God's word says. I know how good God has been to me, and I choose to turn my back on him anyway. That's rebellion. Rebellion is when you go against a righteous authority. Yeah. Yeah. So I only did it once. It's rebellion. Only one of you step is rebellion. Right. He knew his master's will and did not prepare himself 
or do according. When he says or, he's bringing clarity. How do I prepare myself by doing his will? I'm about right, to run. Right, 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 right. How do I prepare myself for the master's return? By doing the will and the work of the Father. Amen. If you want to be prepared for when Jesus comes, just do God's work. Yeah. You, you will never be ill-prepared or ill-equipped when you're doing God's work. Amen. Uh, how do you know that? For we are his workmanship. Yeah. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which he prepared. Yeah. Well, I like this type of church. Yeah. <laughs> If we're just doing what God's word says and we're working the word, when Christ comes, whether it's through the sky or to take us from the grave, we'll always be ready. Amen. Now, the reward of the rebellious is stricter and a more severe punishment. Oh. Who would think that a reward for my disobedience would be punishment? It's a reward. It's a reward. That's what you're working towards. You, you want to have a great reward in your disobedience? God said, I got you. You, you, you want to disobey me and dis, disregard me? Disrespect me and I'm so gracious and merciful towards you? And, and you call yourself by my name? Right, right, right. I got you. What more can I do? Me and Pastor was talking about this. Uh, the prophet, the guy anointed the prophet said, what more can I do? I I I I I, I furrowed the ground for you. I moved all the rocks out of the way for you. What I what, I, I got to build it too. <laughs> Verse forty eight. I'm about to sit down. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. The servant who didn't receive or grasp as much revelation will receive a less severe punishment. Now claiming ignorance isn't an excuse to avoid punishment altogether. Here's why. Because there's always a level of understanding that God gives us to ensure we're able to accomplish his will. So just because you didn't know to do everything that pastor and first lady know to do, you know to do the things you can do right now. Philippians 3.15 says, do what you know to do, and as many as are mature, in due time, God will reveal. In other words, God don't give us more because we're still not functioning in the level that we're supposed to be functioning in right now. He says, as many as are mature, when you get mature enough to handle more, God will give you more. But right now, deal with the light of the revelation that he's given you. Amen. If you're in the third grade, quit trying to jump to the sixth grade. Right, right, right. If you know you don't know that much, quit trying to act like you know so much. Because you don't want to get a worse judgment or a worse punishment because you don't know. Acting like you do. So operate according to the revelation that you got. Now a good example of this is Luke chapter 23 verse 34. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins and the people who killed him, he got the nerve to say, Father, forgive them. Yeah. Why? For they know not what they do. In other words, they know how to kill this man, but they don't know exactly who they're killing. Mm -hmm. Father, forgive them. Wow. Wow. They don't know exactly who they're crucifying. They don't know exactly who they're killing. They don't know exactly who they're executing. They don't know fully what they're doing. They only know partially. Therefore, they have a less severe judgment. Now, now us, we know better. Because the scripture says that when we sin willfully, we crucify him afresh. We know what we're doing. We know it's wrong. We know he goes against it. And yet, we take him off the throne next to the right hand of the Father, put him back on the cross and say, I got it from him. We know better. Our judgment will be more severe. Now, one thing I do like that Jesus did say, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Can you bless them for that? Because he made a reset from the moment he said that. Because if he wouldn't have said, Father, forgive them, you know what the Father would have did? Never mind. Uh, I wanted to say this. Uh, I, I'm going to say this. You have to be careful with the crowd that you follow. The reason why you have to be careful with the crowd that you follow is because crowds are infectious. Yeah, yeah. Crowds will allow you to say, I'm not going to be a part of this, and let's know you're a part of this, and you're doing exactly what the crowd does. Yes, sir. A pastor often mentions when he was sitting at the baseball game, they were doing the wave. He said, I ain't going to be a part of this wave. And like, 
three waves later, he was part of the way. No. <laughs> so you got to be careful with the crowd because crowds are infectious. The same crowd that was saying uh, Hosanna, Hosanna at one point in time is now saying crucify him, crucify him. And from one crowd, from Hosanna to the next one, crucify How did I get here? Yeah. One moment I'm Hosanna, I'm in the blessed crowd. Next thing I'm in, I got to be forgiven crowd. You got to be careful with the crowds you follow. The B clause, verse 48, I'm about to sit down. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. <coughs> the ones to whom God has entrusted much to is expected to do much with. To whom Jesus has invested much in, others will request more from if God has given you a certain amount of power or privilege or influence, he's entrusted you to do much with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do I know he's entrusted me to do much with it? Many request more from it. Jesus breaks this down at the end to say, I know what I deposited in each and every one of you. I know how much it can be multiplied, and I know how much can be extracted. You want the greatness that I can allot, which means you have to deal with the greatness that others will need. So as he blesses us to be faithful and wise, and to avoid being foolish, unfaithful, and evil, just know that God will reward both in accordance with your true faith. And I pray y'all be blessed.